Next, we have our panel discussion on strategies for thriving in Pakistan's digital supply chains, inflation, credit dynamics, and digital imperatives. And uh, may I please request our uh, panel to make it on the stage, to make their way onto the stage. May I request uh, Atif Salim Malik, who's the Chief Operating Officer of JS Bank, to come on stage. Mr. Salman Akhtar, who's the CEO of Techlogix and Adolfi. Shazad Khan, who's a Group Executive Director of Telenor Microfinance Bank. Thank you, Monas. You will be our cheerleader forever. Uh, Sharik Mubin, who is the Chief Digital Officer of Mizan Bank. Mr. Amir Aftab, who is the Chief Product Officer of Jazz Cash. Mr. Imtiaz Jalil, Chief Financial Officer of Tapal T. And of course, no panel can work without a facilitator and a moderator. And this panel will be, this discussion will be moderated by Mr. Noman Lutfi, who's the Chief Supply Chain Officer of Ismail Industries. If I can just take a m m moment to let you know, there are feedback forms being floated around. Please do take some time to fill that out so that future conferences can also incorporate that feedback and make things better. Noman Saab, the panel is over to you, sir. So, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Can you hear me clear? So, uh, before moving to the, my topic of uh, today's discussion of strategies for driving Pakistan digital supply chain with inflation, credit dynamics, and, and digital imperatives, I just build, want to build a little bit supply chain perspective in Pakistan, when it will start working, and how this supply chain finance emerge uh, with the passage of time. So I think it's a matter of, uh, uh, I think it's a supply chain phenomena start working in mid 90s or late 90s in Pakistan. And where the, the supply chain is scattered and it's integrated into, into one function under the umbrella where the main four pillars of supply chain is basically source, plan, make and deliver. And when the supply chain start working together, it's almost, if you can s safely say that it all depends on industries to industries, but it's 60 to 80% of supply chain cost as a percentage of turnover of the organization. And when it's, it's combined, integrated, it gives the value of supply chain that there's the biggest money in the hands of supply chain. And then IT, uh, as a digital part, and IT and, and finance start working as a business partner for supply chain. So with this, I think the, the companies start to understand the leverage of uh, having an integrated supply chain. Uh, not every company has complete integrated model. Still, some companies have divided models as well. But with the emergence, people start understanding the importance. And I think uh, the supply chain savings and uh, working on the cash uh, by reducing the inventory is one of the biggest two things which is basically give a lot of benefits and uh, to the uh, an organization. So having said that, uh, supply chain finance provides an easy solution to the improved working capital for both buyers and suppliers. It especially boosts the prospects for sm small and, and mid-sized businesses that often don't have access to appropriate credit products from our traditional financial institutions. And then according to the latest research, the global supply chain finance market size was valued to USD $7298 million in 2022. And it is expected to expand at a CAGR of 9.08%. And during the period forecast, and reached to USD dollar of one two two nine zero million dollars by by 2028. Again, in, the, in terms of the future, uh, the world world supply chain finance report of global supply chain finance supply chain finance volumes increased by 21 percent between 2021 to 22, with interest rates expected to remain higher throughout the 2024. Business will most likely continue relying on supply chain finance as an alternative to business loans and public or private funding. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, shared a very good uh, statistics and that's the reason that we are here. The rest of the Asian Development Bank countries, similar to Pakistan's size, supply chain finance is around 2.4% of their GDP. And that would translate to financing of uh, rupees 2.5 trillion in Pakistan, which illustrates the opportunity. As I comprise the entire lending by the banking system to the public sector, today is around 10 trillion, which includes corporates, personal, and SMEs. 
Also given that the audience is mostly bankers, 2.5 trillion of supply chain lending would con conserve at rupees 60 billion additional income to the, to the banks. So we will start from this note, we should start now the questions. The first question is with, with uh, Mr. Sharif Mubin. Uh, can you provide us a background on digital supply chain industry in Pakistan? And what role is banking sector playing in growth of digital supply chain financing? Uh, Salkum, sir, uh, to your uh, question, uh, uh, the industry of digital supply chain finance, I think uh, the industry has been around for a very, very long time. Or, uh, uh, financing to always been there, when it exists in the supply chain. It was before manual, now it is in a digital way. But the revolution has really come about when we have started to digitize uh, this entire process of uh, financing uh, through the supply chain. Uh, in our case, in one side of the industry, we have banks who have uh, a lot of uh, liquidity. And on the other hand, we have uh, obviously fintechs, which are also trying to play their role, but they need liquidity, which obviously they can get, they can get from the uh, banking partners if some collaboration can happen. And through this, they can serve the entire supply chain, because the supply chain uh, starts from obviously the suppliers and to the anchor, which is a corporate, and then goes down to uh, distributors and then dealers, and you know, eventually to the retailers. Uh, banks usually like to uh, stay around or hover around the corporate. And the reason for that is, you know, they are, num number one, the reason is that they exist in a formal sector. It is a lot easier for banks to work with them because they already have their corporate relationships with them and they have the clear visibility around their operations and, you know, uh, the, the risk assessment is easier. But as you go down, it becomes more difficult. And then that is the reason why banks hesitate. And so far, they have been hesitant to go into the market down the line, uh, where a lot of these fintechs have sort of found their sweet spot, because the banks have not been able to focus really on that side. And uh, these fintechs have started their, uh, you know, uh, uh, they started their journey from, uh, from this segment. And they'll, then they will go upwards. So this industry primarily will only be able to uh, grow when banks and fintechs together can try and serve this entire uh, ecosystem. Uh, another issue that I see with, uh, you know, uh, with the banks is that banks, because they have a lot of liquidity, for example, Mizan Bank itself has two trillion rupees of deposit, over two trillion rupees of deposit, and they have to lend out at least one trillion rupees to the market to be able to maintain their ADR of 50%. Now, in order to you know, do one trillion rupees of lending, it is very difficult for, for any bank to go down uh, to the uh, retail segment and try and build the book, because that can only happen with the big ticket lending. And big ticket lending obviously happens around the corporates only. So that is their natural uh, inclination or sort of uh, uh, area where they go first. So with this, obviously, the industry has a lot of uh, gaps. Uh, banks will continue to stay around this uh, corporate uh, anchor site. They'll slowly and gradually they'll move downwards, which is started to happen now. For example, Mizan Bank's uh, uh, relationship with Hubble and Mizan Bank's relationship with other fintech partners are, you know, allowing us to go down the line as well. And then we're also looking to partner with, uh, you know, uh, fintechs like Dukan, fintechs like. Uh, uh, other, other such fintechs, Finja, for example, which existed in the past, we partnered with them as well. So this is how the industry is. I think digitization is helping grow uh, this industry very, very rapidly. So we have high hopes, but interest rates are high. And as soon as you, we see the interest rates going down, and obviously the liquidity is required by everybody, so there's a natural demand for it. As soon as the interest rates start to go down, I think every player will, uh, will, will come up and try and fill this gap, inshallah. So that is how I look, I look at this industry at the moment. Good, thank you, Sharik. Yeah. Uh, we'll move into Mr. Atha Salim, sir. Uh, what sector does a supply chain network include, suppliers, manufacturing, distributors, and others? The role of public sector that we need to focus on as one of the largest buyers in the country with the diverse products and services. So how the public sector plays a proactive role in this? Uh, but to, to some extent, I would agree uh, with the, the, what Mudassar said about uh, things pertaining to banking sector. Uh, 
Uh, so I've also had the opportunity of working in uh, Africa, primarily in uh, Kenya and Zambia. So, you know, one of the big uh, success, success factor of, of uh, digital uh, growth over there in those markets was primarily the fact that, you know, banks were not involved. So it was a telco-led model. Okay. So bank, bankers have a particular way of doing business, okay? So they, they can't, or, you know, it takes a very long time for bankers to deviate from the fundamentals of banking. So it's a big problem to change bankers. Karna. <laughs> so uh, that said, I used to work for Union Bank uh, back in the day, I'd say 20 years ago. So, we uh, came up with uh, very uh, you know branded products uh, ye supply chain finance ki product humne ki cash today ke naam se so now you know i think you know there are products which cash now or is tarah platform ho there was no digital element to that but ye products exist karti hain sara aapka international trade is based on these things uh, challenge here is ke hamare yahan pe uh, i would i would uh, 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 think that you know I would like to believe that even corporates have a very myopic vision Sharik Saab ne baat ki ke anchor ko hum dood rahe hote hain wo bada important role play karta hai anchor in this kind of a model but here when I say you know even corporates have a, a very myopic vision nobody would like to uh, uh, um, help in developing this ecosystem wo bhai kyun keh raha hu is liye ke our, we have a very myopic vision and we try to do everything that anyone else can do. So, you know, corporates would like to do discounting themselves if, when it comes to receivable discounting. Because they, they basically want to make a quick buck and they don't look at the longer term benefits that by, you know, uh, becoming a part of an uh, ecosystem where they basically help uh, uh, small and medium enterprises avail in receivable discounting, they are contributing to financial inclusion. Uh, and in the long term, this is going to help them relieve their own cash flows. profit discounting This is exactly what we, we were confronted with. The um, other important thing is the government ka aapne kaha ke kya role hai. Government, public sector plays a very important role. In a country like Pakistan, uh, government is still the largest procurer of goods. Uh, around 19 to 20% of GDP, which is 50 60 billion dollars. हमारे यहाँ पे federal level पे भी और provincial level पे there are very you know, complicated regulations, PEPRA rules हैं और so if public sector can you know play uh, you know some some um, ground uh, groundbreaking uh, sort of a role and provide access to these SMEs, uh, that is going to be, uh, go a long way. अमेरिका की अगर आप बात करते हैं SBA Small Business Administration है अमेरिका की they have developed specific initiatives for SMEs. वहाँ पे उनका quota reserve होता है SMEs के लिए, procurement के लिए, tendering के लिए. So I think this is something that the government can do. और इससे transparency भी होगी government के बीच में जो अभी speed money और ये सारी चीजें exist करती हैं that is going to transform. और हम लोग जो transparency की बात करते हैं वो आगे जाके facilitate करेगी और benefit करेगी SMEs को. So public sector can play a very important role on the regulatory side. I think our regulator is very uh, uh, keen in developing the SME sector. You have heard the Deputy Governor Sahib ki bhi baat suni. Ek, ek SMEs ki funding ki hai banko ne pichle 70 saal mein. So, ek lakh bahatar zar ko 500 arab ki funding di hai. So, ye, uh, this is actually you know, nothing. So, given the fact that you know, aap 5 million or 10 million ki SMEs ki baat karte hai. So, State Bank is very keen in developing the SME sector and I think, you know, uh, thoda sa banko ko partnerships ke upar bhi kaam karna padega is area mein and developing partnerships with the, the fintechs. Uh, we at JS Banks uh, have developed partnership with the Delphi aur humne inke saath apni limited capacity mein kaam kiya. We intend to, you know, uh, go and explore this area of uh, supply chain finance as well. But again, you know, the toughest toughest uh, thing would be to, uh, uh, to identify the right kind of anchor who is willing to extend a help, uh, helping hand in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur Sahib. Uh, I think that both last gentlemen, Sharik Sahib and Walsh, touched based on the uh, FinTech as well. So let's, my next question to the to Mr. Salman Akhtar. Uh, how is the FinTech sector supporting digital supply chain financing in Pakistan? Ji, thank you. So, um, 
the first question you have to ask is, you know, what is the fintech sector even doing here? Why, why does it even have to be here? Uh, and to my mind, there are two roles that it has to play. The first is business model innovation. And the second one is technology innovation. Okay. Now, out of the two, the one that is f by far the less important one is technology innovation. I say that as a technologist, that technology is table stakes. If you don't have technology, you literally couldn't be a fintech. You know, why are you a fintech if you don't have technology? So that's a given. The real game is business model innovation. And the real game over there is for those fintechs to identify those gaps and opportunities that exist in the larger economy and to say, okay, here is an opportunity, I can help plug this opportunity to innovate in the business model itself. Hmm. Banks do not have to innovate in business models. They have a very simple business model that's working really well for them. So that's why they don't need to innovate. That's where the fintechs come in. They need to do the hard work of innovating in terms of business models and say, you know what, here's a really interesting business model. Here's a market opportunity. This is going to be, instead of earning you K plus two or K plus one, which the corporates give you, you'll get K plus 10, you'll get K plus 12. So you'll make more money as long as the model actually makes sense. Okay, so that's why fintechs should exist. Now, I do think that, unfortunately, over the last two, three years, uh, a lot of the industry went down what were essentially dead ends, the fintech industry. Uh, because in 2021, there was a huge amount of liquidity in terms of venture capital available, so a lot of people raised a lot of money, and everybody thought we will ourselves become lenders. Now, in retrospect, that was an absurd idea. I mean, there is no way a fintech is going to match the balance sheet of a bank, right? So everybody, and when they say, when, when fintech said we will become lenders, of course, banks would say, why should we partner with you? You are our competitors. Why, why should we partner with you? Fair, you know, fair point. So I think, unfortunately, the industry went a little bit of a sort of a blind alley. I think people have now realized that you really can't scale your balance sheet as a fintech. You need to partner with a bank and scale on the bank's balance sheet, which is the asset that the bank has. Mm -hmm. There's another huge asset that banks in Pakistan have, which is very different from the African situation. Pakistan is a much bigger country than pretty much every African country other than one or two. What that means is that banks are much bigger than African banks, mm -hmm. which means they have many more customers than African banks. Because if you think about it, what have banks done in the last 50 years? They've done two things. They've built up a balance sheet, but they've also built up a customer base. Now, mm -hmm. we all know this customer base is seriously under lent, whether it is the SME part of the customer base or the consumer part of the customer base, the corporate side is, is lent into, but these two are not. There's a whole bunch of SME customers that all of you bankers already have in your, they're your existing customers, okay? You're just giving them liability accounts, that's it. You're actually spending money on them, that's a loss leader, that liability account is a loss leader. You're actually losing money on them when you could make money on them if you could actually create the asset side relationships, which is what digital supply chain finance is all about. Mm -hmm. So banks in Pakistan have two enormous advantages compared to, you know, one is, the balance sheet, the other one is the customers. So really, if you bring a fintech that can do the business innovation and say, you know what, we can serve SME customers this way, for example. And then they can partner ideally with a bank and say, we'll use your balance sheet. And by the way, to get started, we'll just use your customers. You have SME customers. Why go finding new customers when you already have SME customers? Okay? And that is the last point I'd like to make, which is that I mean, digital supply chain, finance, very good. We're all looking for anchors. By the way, every banker, you are yourself an anchor. suppliers. I'm a supplier to you. Techlogics, my other hat, we're a supplier to you. Why don't you all start DCSF programs with your own suppliers? please. So my point is, there's a huge amount of low-hanging fruit, but it does need some serious business model innovation, which is what the fintechs need to do. Think hard, really get into the depth of what's happening in the economy, and then identify ke kaun se wo areas hai where you can make an impact. Thank you. Thank you, Salman. I think you have used a very valid point that we also have suppliers and customers. Can we start from them? Yes. So start from the home, and then we can move yes. forward. That can be a big, big uh, I think, uh, lesson for others.
So we heard about FinTech, we heard about bank. So, and let's see what FMCG thinks about it. So we are moving to uh, Mtiaz Jalil, who is the CFO in Tapal. So Mtiaz, over to you, that what supply chain plays a major role in value creation for any company. In an integral, integrated business environment, how finance function can partner with supply chain to create that value. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. So uh, a bit of a different question uh, where a lot of bankers are sitting, so <laughs> I'll talk about more about uh, from a manufacturing perspective and or, or a PNL of a company, uh, how a finance function actually works and create value in integration with, with supply chain function of an organization. So um, as Doman, you pointed out earlier while you identified the key pillars of a supply chain operations like source, plan, make, deliver, uh, and sometimes you also add returns to it. Uh, so this is this is a core function of a supply chain in any any manufacturing organization, yeah. Uh, and and in recent times, all the good manufacturing organizations they do have a finance function which actually directly um, partner with the supply chain organization, so that uh, uh, in an integrated manner, the supply chain colleagues will be able to deliver value for the company. And when I say value for the company, it is actually uh, the value for the shareholders. And, and that can be created, of course, um, either through generation of profits and, and also through uh, generation of free cash flow. Uh, so, uh, when we talk about finance, how finance is, is partnering with supply chain, so I, I would say finance actually partners in all these pillars. Um, and how finance does it? Through um, uh, cost optimization uh, in collaboration with supply chain, uh, so that we can have a, a better profitability for the organization as a whole. Then uh, having integrated or aligned um, uh, KPIs, so that both finance and supply chain will be able to deliver, again, certain goals for the organization. Uh, then uh, another important aspect is, is a strategic partnership, which is when, when you uh, are having a discussion uh, in, in, for, with relation to investments into the business, capex, um, and other making other strategic calls. And of course, uh, at the end of the day, finance uh, has, has a collaborative mindset, so it collaborates with all functions across the company, other than supply chain as well, so when it partners with sales, with marketing. So that creates a 360 degree effect on the company where, where finance is partnering with all the functions. Now, if I, if I talk about more on, on cost optimization, uh, which was my first point, uh, so cost optimization, if, if you uh, deep dive into it, it has, of course, a material cost, which is one of the biggest cost component. Then you have non-material cost. So when we talk about material cost, of course, it has raw material, packaging material, um, uh, when, when you are producing something. And when, when you are having this um, non-material cost, it includes uh, one big ticket item, which is logistics, warehousing. Uh, that, that is a big cost for a company. And one, one hidden element would be, uh, Noman, uh, as you know, uh, is, is business waste. When, when you produce a lot and when you are unable to sell it, uh, then you have to throw it away. So that is, that is a cost that, that you have incurred into the business and you are not getting any return out of that. So that is why uh, it all starts from planning. You have to plan well whatever you are sourcing, whatever you are producing. Uh, you have in collaboration with your sales colleague, you have to sell it so that you don't waste it. Um, other than that, I think if, if we talk about like more into cost optimization, uh, finance helps supply chain in, in uh, negotiations with the suppliers because when you talk about raw material, whether those are imported materials or local materials from where you are sourcing, whether you are sourcing in bulk or there is some MOQ issue. So, so at what cost you are procuring those raw materials and bringing into your, your premises, uh, either into your country or into your, your factory premises. Then in terms of packaging material, of course, it, it depends of, on a lot of feedstock, petrochemicals, so it is really important to understand um, uh, how your packaging cost is, is comprised of and how, how you can reduce it. Um, and, and, and so on. And particularly also on logistics and warehousing, again, it depends how much you have to produce for that production, how much warehousing cap capacity you need. And then when you are shipping it to the customers or to the distributors, uh, whether you are doing it in an optimized manner or not. 
Um, and, and both of these elements, I think, uh, uh, the, all, all of these rather elements um, impact the profitability of the company and, uh, and also uh, cash flow, which is, which is um, uh, you know, a big, big discussion these days. Uh, the companies who are, who are uh, here to make profits, they want to make profit, but also uh, the shareholders, they want to have cash. So you have to convert that profit into cash. So first of all, you have to earn profit, and then you have to find out ways so that you can generate generate adequate amount of cash that can be utilized either again reinvestment into the business or in terms of like dividends to the shareholders. So when we talk about this cash flow, I think, um, as I said, it is important to improve the profitability of the company through all these cost optimization and, and other measures. Uh, but then after, uh, after that, uh, it is, it is important to have a look on, uh, on uh, how much uh, working capital is invested, how much stock you are carrying. And when I talk about stock, it means how much finished goods you are carrying in, in your books, how much raw material, packaging material you are carrying, because <coughs> you, uh, probably you have paid for it and that, that, uh, that investment, that cash, has, uh, that cash outflow has been done. And now, after some time, you will be able to produce from the, that raw and packaging material, and then you will sell it. And only after that you will get your money back and, and if you are selling on credit, that, that money will come after like 30, 60 or 90 days. So all in all, this working capital cycle is really, really important apart from profitability of the companies and, and, and from finance side, um, we, we generally work with supply chain to identify what is the optimum inventory period we should keep in terms of raw material, packaging material, and also finished goods, so that we can have a good and effective working capital cycle, and that can help an organization, not only with profitability, but also with healthy generation of cash. Thank you, Mithyas. Now moving to uh, Mr. Shahzad Khan. Uh, Shahzad, what technological advancement and adoption have taken place in recent times? Thank you, Naman. I'm going to uh, answer this question a little differently because I think a lot of technology has been discussed today. <laughs> so I think, uh, especially in the case of Pakistan, the adoption of the current technology available to us is much more important than the new technology. Uh, the basic technology available to everyone is digital payments, right? And the uptake of the digital payments gives a platform for others to build on it. For example, nano loans, buy not pay later, the e-commerce platform, they're all built on top of the data generated by the digital payments. So in Pakistan, I think uh, uh, Easy Pesa and Jazz Cash has, have done pretty well in terms of the consumer space, but we are far behind in the merchant space as far as our competition with our neighboring countries are concerned and countries with similar demographics. So Easy Pesa and Jazz Cash uh, contribute more than 10 trillion transactions uh, in a year, but the P2M portion is less than 10%, right? But if you look at our neighboring country, which is India, so they do, the UPI does 70 trillion transactions. And out of the 70 trillion, 52% are P2M transactions, right? So the scale is so different. They have, they have such a big scale on the P2M network, so they can build on it, right? So this gives us an opportunity and a problem statement that our SME segment and our merchants and our retailers need financing. So uh, I'll throw some boring numbers so that I can build on it. So Pakistan has around 2 million merchants. It does not include the uh, nano merchants, which is a one-man shop. And out of the 2 million merchants, half of them are FMCG merchants. The access to credit is less than 8%. And 90% of the transactions are in cash. So this gives everyone an opportunity to first of all automate the overall value chain and then do a financing line for the retailers. So this is what we have done, right? So, so all the platform players who bring the technology to automate all values of the, all steps of the value chain will be successful. Like Easy Pesa Karobar, right? So hats off to Mones for uh, collaborating with Easy Pesa and bringing Easy Pesa Karobar to the ecosystem. So we, we launched six months ago. I think the results are remarkable. Uh, it has a front end for uh, it has a front end for the customer to do the payments. It has a back end which is connected to the distributors to do the payments. 
it has an overall ecosystem in which retailers can buy from the distributors and it has an embedded finance line based on the scorecard mm -hmm. i think we can all we can all learn as an industry from the from from the model that we have developed over time uh, i've been we, we have been doing payments for a long time now so we have around more than 100000 retailers paying to distributors but this is the time when we have started building on what we have as an asset and that asset is really working out for us. And, and, and State Bank has really appreciated how we are doing this, and, and I think the, the new regulation from State Bank also regarding uh, making supply chain a man mandatory model mm -hmm. is, is, is a step in the right direction. Apart from this, uh, you asked about what technologies do you see in the future. So, I mean, technology is important, but the current adoption of the technology already available is also important. Yeah. I see that soft pause is going to be the next big thing, right? So, all over the world, uh, we, after Afsa and we were in a, at a conference with Vizia, and, and they, were, they were pushing for the soft pause to be integrated with everyone. So, all big players and small players are looking at soft pause because the cost of business cost of doing business goes down. Also, I think the, the, the transaction of the, the cost of the transaction has really gone up because Nadra is the one eventually benefiting from all the transactions. So I think facial recognition is going to be the next big thing. Uh, we are also experimenting and other companies are also experimenting to build their own database so that they can do their KYC in-house. They don't have to go to a third party mm. and, and, and do the KYC. Uh, Last but not the least, I see Rast as a game changer, right? It's go this is going to be a domino effect. And uh, once the adoption of Rast has been established in the market, the retailer sees the benefit, the financing is included, then I think the, the flywheel will, will, will go. So uh, one of my mentors sitting here said that uh, the offline feeds online. So I think the offline uh, ecosystem is, is, is being developed. And uh, it's, now is the time when the offline is going to feed online. A couple of years ago, I think all of us tried that the QR payments uh, were established in all over the market. In even my team, we did a couple of hundred thousand retailers, right? The traction was not coming. We had to incentivize. The, the customer was not bothered to do an, uh, a QR payment. Now is the time when customers are asking for a digital payment because it's simply very easy. Hmm. It's, it's easy to carry cash, uh, it's easy to not carry cash, and uh, the digital wallet and all of the ecosystem is now coming together. So I think now is the time when I think financing um, of the merchant along with the distributor and the customer payments combined together will have uh, a big platform and everyone can contribute to the platform. That's it for myself. I think, thank you, Shahzad, and I think uh, very well said, I think, and the comparison between the neighboring country, it's, it's I think, give a lot of, um, uh, you know, to work has to be done in Pakistan. So, and moving to the similar kind of industry, I just ask uh, Ahmed Aftab, that how is cellular industry providing support to digital supply chain finance? Thank you very much, uh, Anuman. I would say in three ways. So it's a connectivity, reach, and data. Connectivity is a given. Uh, I mean, every mobile app solution or digital solution needs a data connectivity, even in future, even in now. So that's a given. Reach is what a telco or a cell network brings in in terms of its large distribution and agent network. As an example, for example, in case of Jazz Cash and even Easy Pesa, the amount of consumers that we've been able to bring on board, and then specifically, for example, in Jazz Cash, we have more than 300,000 merchants or micro enterprises who are receiving digital payments now. This has been uh, because of the vast reach of the agent network that the telco operator brings in. Uh, it actually helps to penetrate in tier two and tier three markets. Uh, majority of our merchants, they are tier two, they are tier three, and they are receiving digital payments. The same network actually then helped us to bring on distributors on board. So we have, for example, more than 50 large distributors on board uh, to which the same merchants are now making supplier payments. Thirdly comes the data, the telco data that actually helps credit score these merchants or these micro enterprises. Most of them, for example, with Jazz Cash uh, are the ones who were unbanked. There's no credit history for them. So the telco data actually helped us credit score them better. And then now, in their supplier payment journey, we are introducing credit financing facilities. So this complete value chain, uh, the telco reach, availability of data combined together, that creates uh, the value. And I think this would continue to create the value because uh, even now we see that for the conventional banks, uh, it's still going to be very difficult to penetrate into the tier two and tier three markets. 
And this is where the partnership comes in. It doesn't mean that a fintech alone can work or a telco alone can work mm. or their agent or distribution network alone can work. Uh, the digital banks alone can work. Uh, so it, there needs to be a very good partnership together, hand in hand, and then work towards uh, what we have in Jazz Cash, we call an ambition towards a cashless economy. Okay, thank you, um, Ahmed. I think after the completion of the first round, the, the one thing which I can extract is a collaborative model which is required. And no, nobody can do it alone. So I think a lot of collaborative work is required and somebody has to anchor that with the teams. So with moving, that's, uh, moving to Imtiaz again. So Imtiaz, what are some of the main challenges in the cost of raw material infrastructure and inventory management and the loss distribution in the companies right now? Yeah, so before I touch upon the challenges, I think again, I just want to reiterate that why uh, uh, this cost is important. Yeah, so when we talk about profitability of any organization, if you want to increase the profit uh, in, the, in these hard times, I think there could be three, three big elements. One, either you have to increase the volume so that you can have a better fixed cost absorption, or you have to increase the price of the product so that you can have a better margin. Otherwise, you have to decrease your cost so that you can have better, better profitability of the company. So in the current scenario, we know that because of high inflation, uh, it is really difficult for the organizations to increase uh, the, the pricing for the consumers because, you know, pr uh, because of various um, uh, economic issues in the country, it is really difficult for the consumers to, to pay more for, for the same quality of goods. So while the companies are ensuring to provide the same consistent quality of goods to their consumers, it is really difficult at this point in time to increase pricing. Hence, there is a pressure on the profit. Therefore, it is really important to look at different cost parameters and the challenges in cost so that we can uh, try and have some strategies to reduce cost uh, and, and in order to have better profitability. So when we, I talk about cost challenges, um, uh, I think inflation, as I mentioned, is one big challenge because, you know, if you want to, uh, to, to procure raw material, packaging material to have your finished goods. So this is one big element that, uh, that not only consumers, individuals, but also corporates, that those are struggling with the cost element because of high inflation prevailing not only in Pakistan, but also recently we have seen uh, inflation in other parts of the world. So if you are importing something from, from Europe or Africa or some uh, any other country in the world, uh, the cost is more. And also with uh, the, the devaluation that happened last year, um, in terms of imported raw and packaging material, the, the costs have gone up. Um, other than inflation, I would say that uh, last year, as we have all seen uh, the import restrictions, that has also added or contributed to the cost of, of the products because the, the things were not available. There was a uh, discussion on whether whether you are importing an essential commodity or a non-essential good. You know, uh, so availability of that material or goods was 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 a challenge which was triggering uh, um, cost escalation as well. Then, other other than that, of course. Uh, when we talk about logistics and, 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 and warehousing, it depends upon how much you have to store and then what infrastructure you have. If you have your own infrastructure, that will have a different cost challenge. If you are going for a third party, again, it could have a variable and fixed cost model and that, that, that will increase over a period of time. So uh, uh, all in all, I would say that uh, this is all, all um, a 360 sort of a model whereby when, we, when you want to improve your profitability, you have to look towards your cost and you, when you have to see the cost, you have to bro break those costs down into uh, various elements, whether those are material costs or whether those are non-material costs, logistic, warehousing. Um, and one more element is, is, is if, if, if I talk about PNL, is depreciation. Yeah, and depreciation comes from if you if you are investing into your own capex, and that also relates back to cash flow. Uh, that whatever you are earning as a, as a profit and whatever cash you are generating, it's a big decision that you have to to, to think about um, if you want to invest that back into your own company in terms of capex. So if you do the capex, uh, because if you need it because of the production requirements, one, you will use your cash, and on the other hand, there will be a cost hit in the PNL in terms of depreciation. So uh, from a finance angle or a, from, from supply chain angle, I think that is why we need a very collaborative sort of an effort from both the functions uh, so that uh, both can join hands and do a collaborative work and make a strategy uh, which eventually uh, help the company in terms of both profitability and free cash flow. Thank you, Mtas. Uh, let's move to Shahzad Khan again. Shahzad, what changes are needed in supply chain finance from a regulatory perspective? 
a good question. <laughs> So first of all, I think the, the step recently taken by State Bank and making the supply chain finance overall mandatory for all banks is a step in the right direction. You know, there's enough room for everyone. So if you look at the market, the GMV is around $100 billion overall. And there are not many players who are using this data or not many players in the market. So it's a, it's a step in the right direction. Secondly, for, for, for overall digital banking and, and the fintech industry to survive, the cost of cash in is going up uh, because the regulator has asked us to implement a biometric on, any on all the transactions, right? So for millions of transactions, uh, pr uh, the cost of doing business is going up by six rupees, which the main beneficiary is Nadra. So uh, we would request the regulator to speak to Nadra and reduce the cost <laughs> and help us in this transition. And I think uh, l last but not the least, overall, the, the transaction of QR needs to be promoted, right? So there are many digital transactions which are being incentivized in small pockets. So you see on digital banking cards, there's a discount of 10% uh, on the FPR tax. Also, in, uh, on, in, that is limited to only few cities and few segments. So our request should be that in order to promote the QR and the last QR, it should be opened up for everyone and it should be opened up in all the cities and all the segments so that we can promote the digital transactions, mm -hmm. that the transactions become an engine and then banks can benefit of it and they can lend to the uh, customer segments. So there are actually two, two types of engines at work. One is the customer payments, the other one is the distributor payments, right? We alone cannot cover the distributor payments. We do a substantial amount, but the main engine, uh, the main model followed across the world is customer payments. So we need to increase the digital payments from the customer side in order for this, uh, uh, model to flourish. Thank you. Thank you, Shad. I think a similar kind of question, one is just talking about the uh, legal perspective, regulatory perspective. I'm moving to Ahmed Afta. That what other supports are needed from the government to prosper us in this, in this field? I think not much different from what Shazad has already talked about. So it is about uh, incentivizing digital payments, mm. but at the same point in time, penalizing cash. Uh, until and unless we don't make cash expensive, digital payments will not actually happen. Uh, and extending them, so uh, Shahzad gave an example. So we have, for example, um, in Punjab, in federal here, so there's a tax rebate on uh, the restaurants. Extend that to, for example, grocery stores. Extend that to tier two and tier three markets. Have it uh, done on the P2M RAST uh, QRs. Because what we've seen is the consumer will then are actually forced to make digital payments. The micro enterprises or these tier two, tier three grocery stores, they are forced to keep that digital payment uh, system uh, in place and make cash expensive. How can it be done? It's been done. Uh, the example is uh, China. In China, there are 86 million merchants with QR, 86 million merchants with QR. There's actually no cash. I visited uh, China a couple of weeks back, uh, and we were having a discussion with, the, um, uh, with a few of the players, and we asked them that, you know, how does cash in, cash out happens? They say, what cash in, cash out? There is no cash. So that is actually a cashless economy. So there were some mandates from the government where, you know, you have to have a digital payment mechanism in place. So mandate incentivizing the uh, uh, digital payments, uh, penalizing cash, and how it actually helps the you know, ultimate mission of uh, supply chain financing. We've seen uh, through fact, uh, as an experience, the merchants that we bring on board for digital payments, those merchants are more inclined to make payments to the supplier through the digital means. And then the same merchants are more inclined to adopt a digital uh, finance uh, supply chain solutions because we are offering closed loop loans between the payments towards the distributor. So it starts from the first point. Uh, if there is an incentivization at the same point in time of penalization, uh, so overall this will have a positive uh, impact. But then it's about reducing the tax. This is how it comes out to be, but not exactly because you know, you reduce a certain thing, the volume actually increases. This will have a certain benefit. I think very well uh, summarized by uh, um, uh, I'm coming to Arthur Salim, sir. Uh, SMEs access to finance, challenges for customers and opportunities for banks. 
I think it's a very uh, challenging uh, sort of a field for banks and it can't be done without having a dedicated uh, SME arm within the bank. So I think uh, State Bank has basically uh, taken a very tough stance now and you know they are asking every bank to have a dedicated SME arm. So same goes for the other stakeholders within the system. So as far as everybody, every stakeholder needs to play its role. As Amir was mentioning that you know they have to, uh, uh, the government has to uh, penalize cash. I think uh, it has more to do with penalties. I think we need to come up with the right kind of incentive structure to discourage cash. So that is going to go a long way. Um, I, I, I don't know, you know, I uh, have had the opportunity of working for various uh, initiatives in various geogra geographies, things which work perfectly well in some of the geographies we can't actually make them work here in Pakistan. I don't know why is it so. Um, I'll share an example. Uh, although, you know, there are a lot of similarities, as Mudassar mentioned, in Africa and Pakistan. So I was in Kenya, and uh, we developed a platform for a dairy um, um, a processor, UKCC. And this was a real-time online platform. Uh, where uh, they used to procure milk from uh, the farmers, small farmers and mid-sized farmers. And uh, we used to discount their receivables instantly. Uh, so it was basically a tripartite arrangement. We had the farmers, uh, then we had the dairy processor, and the bank was the intermediary which was doing that financing. I think no bank uh, has been able to do that despite the f in Pakistan, despite the fact that we produce around 62 billion liters of milk only 3% is processed. Even if you take uh, that 3% into account, that would be around 300 to 400 billion rupees. So that is still an untapped sort of a market. Uh, so I think you know every stakeholder needs to play its its role within the uh, ecosystem. Government has to come in with the right kind of regulatory framework. Um, then um, SPP is already you know the, the, I think you know they don't uh, we don't want too much of regulator uh, intervening in everything. I think you know they 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 are doing their best. Uh, they've just uh, provided a sort of level playing field, and that's that's what their job is, and they just keep on. Pro promoting the right areas and then the banks have to rise to the occasion as well because SME financing is totally a different uh, sort of a ball game it's uh, different than investing in T-bills and PIBs so <laughs> we need to have a different mindset uh, only uh, uh, with that kind of a mindset we'll be able to develop the kind of underwriting skills which are needed to um, un uh, underwrite SMEs thank you um, I'm moving to Sharif and Bean. Uh, we hardly see any growth in SMEs. And if this situation prevails, what do you think it affects the digitalization process? Uh, well, uh, the growth in SMEs, I think uh, that's uh, sort of irrelevant at the moment because we already have a lot of untapped SMEs. Uh, we, as we discussed in the morning as well, that out of 5 million SMEs that we have in Pakistan, only 170,000 or so have access to finance through the formal sector. So I think what we need to do is simply we need to start to capture uh, this market and that will start with the, the first step is always going to be payments. And as we've all discussed that QR is coming around, right? And the QR will become the key source for uh, these merchants to start accept the digital uh, payments. Once you start to you know, uh, do the payments, that will lead into the production of data. <clears throat> and that data will eventually be used for uh, financing. So I think this is going to be a simple step-by-step -step process. And I, I'm very optimistic because, you know, uh, with the RAST P2M coming up, State Bank is also very uh, supportive. And State Bank is not only supportive, but at the same time, State Bank is instructing banks, actually, to go out and, uh, you know, expand this network of uh, RAS P2M merchants. So far, we only had you know five uh, acquirers in the market. Acquirers meaning those banks who could issue a POS machine to a to a merchant. But now with RAS P2M, we'll have around 40 acquirers in the market. So imagine the impact that these 40 acquirers can you know uh, uh, can create in the ecosystem. So I'm hopeful that uh, once, for example, right now we have 150,000 uh, merchants and it grows to, uh, let's say, over a million merchants in a, in a matter of two to three years, that will automatically create a big market for all of us. And, uh, and hopefully uh, supply chain finance will also start to take off from there. 
Thank you. I think what I learned from your um, answer is that despite SME low growth, but still the potential is there. Yeah. We'll start tapping it. The last question from uh, Salman Saab. Um, information sharing with banks, utilization, is this a risk to the organization sometimes because they feel that why we have to show or share a lot of data with, it, with them? What's the fear factor in it and how can we address it? Amikia? So to answer this question, you know, I, I think we need to break out the, you know, the kinds of data into three types. So the first type of data is what we talked about in the morning, which is the data that banks possess about your and my account. Now that's well understood now globally that this really belongs to the customer. That ultimately this belongs to the customer and the customer should be free to utilize that data for other purposes, including for example, using it being for, a, for it to be used for lending purposes. Now of course to do that correctly, what you need is some kind of permissioning architecture which allows me as a customer to reliably instruct my bank to share this information with the third party. For example, India has done that in India Stack. So there are well-established models of doing it. It's really, it's a fairly simple technical problem. Okay, so that's one kind of data. The second kind of data is where data is generated and collected by a business in the course of doing business. So for example, let's say you have an e-commerce merchant. They generate data, sales data, about, about their customers. Right? So they, they, have, they own this data. They've generated this, 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 dig, this digital data. Same thing is true for the telcos. So you know, they, they have customers, people use their phone, they're generating data. Now here it's actually not clear who owns this data. It's, it's pretty clear that the data is in the possession of the service provider or the e-commerce seller or the telco. And generally I think the idea has been that this data actually belongs to them. That this is really their data. This data should also be utilized for purposes like digital supply chain and lending. And this is where the collaboration has to come in, where the owners of this data, and it's not just the telcos. For example, TCS owns a lot of data. It delivers courier services for everybody in Pakistan. So it owns a lot of data, right? Every e-commerce service provider has data. So this kind of data, actually, we need to put in place collaboration mechanisms. I don't think here there is the need for a permission architecture. I don't think really it's reasonable for me to allow TCS to share the fact that I sent seven packages in TCS in the last two years. Like, okay, really, do, do they need my permission for that? So I think that's the second part of it. This data, by the way, is extremely valuable for lending purposes, whether it's supply chain or anything else. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a third category of data also. This is data which is either survey data or self-reported data. Now, what's that? So survey data is, for example, you know, somebody goes and does a survey, that this is 10, 50 shops in this shopping area, which sometimes are used as proxies for lending. Now, that data is very problematic. Generally speaking, the people who do this low quality data, you really can't rely on it. So that's, that's very problematic data. Another category like this is um, self-reported data, like for example, you see in these credit book apps, Mary sales yeah. Well, you know what, tum kare ho ye sales ho you know, why I have no way of verifying this. So to my mind, for the finance lending function, the data that is useful must pass three tests. Number one, it must be third party collected data. For example, my phone data is owned, is collected by Jazz. I'm a Jazz customer, okay? So it's third party data, they have collected it. I'm not telling the bank that I use my phone this much. They can tell the bank that I use the phone this much. So it's third party data, that's, it's reliable, okay? Second, it must be digitally collected. Obviously, you know, you don't want hard to collect data. And the third, for lending purposes, it must be directly financially relevant. So for example, you know, if you use the fact that, um, I don't know, I live in a house which is X, X size big, that's not directly financially relevant to my well-being because I might have inherited that house and maybe I don't have any money, but I just don't live in that house. So as long as you can pass these three tests, and I think the first category, the data that the banks own, and the second category, third party digitally collected data by people like telcos, courier companies, you know, e-commerce companies, what have you. There's a whole bunch of people who have data. These are really the goal that can be used to drive uh, lending decisions by banks. 
Okay. I think, uh, 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 thank you, um, Salman Sahib. I think what I learned from all of you in the two sessions of questions that uh, there are a lot of things available. It just needs the government has to make some in incentivization and from a cash to move to, to I think, digitalization. And a, a, a sort of collaboration is also required. So which, which basically uh, take this up. So uh, thank you very much again for all of you. And we are open for take questions from the yeah. Can you please uh, give the mic to her? With your permission, the answer before the mic reaches yeah, please, please. the participant here, I would like to add something. Uh, Salman Saab has made a very valid point regarding uh, the data that banks have. When we were uh, uh, doing deliberations on these SME committee uh, for banking sector, uh, we figured out that you know banks have uh, on one side the uh, banks have only extended credit to 170,000 uh, borrowers. On the other side, they have. Uh, access to 2.3 million accounts, liability accounts, and banks have not even explored or scratched the surface to figure out what are those uh, liability clients doing with them, what is their transaction behavior, what kind of businesses, what kind of sectors are they working into. Okay. Uh, the other uh, uh, bit that I think you know we need to explore collectively, that's basically logistics finance. What is currently happening, uh, Salman Sab made a very valid point regarding TCS. So this, this uh, with this, uh, during the COVID era, uh, a lot of uh, cash and delivery business basically, uh, you know, th th that uh, expanded very uh, at a very fast pace. So that's basically the started the starting point for logistics finance business because I I don't think that you know any financial institution has effectively explored that area so far. Similarly, other areas like ex you know warehouse receipt financing. So in, in Pakistan, I was associated with one of the initiatives, but that was primarily targeting agri sector. But future is, is for logistics finance. Uh, Chinese are estimating that there, th this sector, logistics finance, would be around over $5 trillion in the next couple of years. So this is the area where I think you know, all the stakeholders within the uh, you know, ecosystem need to work aggressively and explore these areas. Thanks. Sorry for taking this extra. No, no, I think this is a good addition. Ji, yeah. alaikum. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I have just one observation, and any of the panelists can, you know, throw a further light on that. Uh, I must say that one key takeaway for today's session is that we need a collaborative approach uh, among different platform players, especially with regards to data. Just as Salman Sahib ne bhi mentioned kiya, ki data is available in different forms with different stakeholders. Chai TCS ki baat ho, telcos ki baat ho, banks ki baat ho. Uh, for example, KYC hota hai. KYC एक बैंक भी करता है दूसरा बैंक उसी बैंक कस्टमर का दोबारा से केवाईसी कर रहा है तो व्हाई कांट वी यू नो डेवलप सम सेंट्रलाइज्ड डिपॉजिटरी ऑफ द डाटा एंड आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट द ऑर्गेनाइजर टू यू नो बिकॉज ये मेरा हाल है एक ऐसा पॉइंट है जिस पे सारे स्टेक होल्डर का कंसेंसस है कि डाटा की ओनरशिप और डाटा को एक सेंट्रलाइज्ड तरीके से इकट्ठा किया जाए इन ऑर्डर टू लेवरेज फॉर डिफरेंट मार्केट प्लेयर्स टू यू नो टेक एडवांटेज यूनिट कास्टिंग के हिसाब से यूनिट इकोनॉमिक्स के पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से रिस्क असेसमेंट पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से एंड यू नो इन ऑर्डर टू एनहांस द Added uh, the uh, appetite in the market. So uh, KYC is centralized. KYC ho jaye. Agar ek bank ne kar liya hai, to baaki sare banks ko KYC karne ki zarurat nahi hai. For example, Sharik Mubin ki, Yath Malik Yan Vid Mushtaq ki, and so so on. Isi tarah jaise credit bureau hota hai. For example, ECIB hai. ECIB ke andar agar consumer ne different banks se financial loans liye hue hai, to uski credit history available hoti hai. Aur ye uh, malum ho jata hai ECIB uh, se ki kis bank se kitna loan liya without naming the bank. So we can do something like that on the same level ke kisi bank mein ek account khola hua hai customer ne, to pata chal jaye ki uska wahan पे डिपॉजिट बैलेंस क्या है उसका टर्नओवर क्या है चाहे वो मल्टीपल अकाउंट्स हैं विदाउट नेमिंग द बैंक ऑब्वियसली दैट इज अ सीक्रेट इंफॉर्मेशन फॉर अ पर्टिकुलर फाइनेंशियल इंस्टीट्यूशन सो आई वुड से दैट ऑर्गेनाइजर्स कैन फॉर्मुलेट रिकमेंडेशंस फॉर द रेगुलेटर फॉर द गवर्नमेंट एंड फॉर द रिलेवेंट अथॉरिटीज टू यू नो टेक द ओनरशिप एंड फॉर्मुलेट अ सेंट्रल डिपॉजिटरी ऑफ द डाटा वेयर ऑल द स्टेक होल्डर्स कैन लेवरेज दैट डाटा इन ऑर्डर टू बेनिफिट द एंटायर इकॉनमी इन फॉर द एंटायर बेनिफिट ऑफ द एंटायर इकोसिस्टम So okay. that 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 would so be my suggestion. So, uh, or you like can choose. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So, so, uh, <coughs> Nabeed, this uh, is such that EKYC, a project state bank, has already a Bonza Solutions as a provider. So they are developing a solution on blockchain. 
and which is going to be shared EKYC uh, platform for all of the banks. So it has been going on for some time. I don't know what is the current status, but this is a project which is already uh, under uh, process. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank you very much to the panel. May I please request uh, uh, Hamza Hashmi uh, to join me on stage and also Adnan Rizvi Saab, who's the Managing Director of KPMG Pakistan, to help thank our panelists. Can I please have the shield for Mr. Asif, uh, Mr. Atif Salim Malik, who is the Chief Oper Operating Officer of JS Bank. Thank you very much, sir. This is a memento for Mr. Atif Salim Malik, who is the Chief Operating Officer of JS Bank. Thank you very much, sir, for your insights and for your feedback and comments. Next, we move on to uh, Salman Akhtar, who's the CEO of TechLogix and Adolfi. Our third panelist. Third panelist who we'd like to thank is Mr. Shazad Khan, who's the Group Executive Director of Telenor Microfinance Bank. Next panelist we'd like to thank is Mr. Sharik, Sharik Mubin, who is the Chief Digital Officer at Mizan Bank. Amir Aftab, who is the Chief Product Officer of Jazz Cash. I'd like to present a token of our appreciation to Imtiaz Jalil, who is the Chief Financial Officer at Tapal T. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Mr. Noman A. Lutfi, who's the Chief Supply Chain Officer at Ismail Industries. If I could please request, after the shield is presented to Noman Saab, if uh, all the gentlemen can um, gather for a, uh, for a group photograph. And while they take the photograph, just wanted to remind you, there are feedback forms on your tables. Please do take a moment to uh, give us your feedback so that it may be incorporated for future event, a few f for the future conferences. Thank you very much.